We've got a session tonight, uh, this afternoon that will be moderated by Nicola Hedge, who leads the San Diego Foundation's Climate Initiative, working with donors, nonprofits, businesses, and government partners to spur action to reduce regional greenhouse gas emissions and deepen community awareness about the local impacts of climate change. Nicola earned her master's degree from UCSD School of International Relations and Pacific Studies. Joining her on the, uh, on the panel this afternoon is Brendan Reed. He is the Environmental Resource Manager for the City of Chula Vista, where he's responsible for the development of energy and, uh, development of energy and sustainability of initiatives. Brendan also represents Chula Vista on numerous regional and statewide working groups, including the San Diego Regional Climate Collaborative and the League of California Cities Environmental Quality Policy Committee. Also on the panel this afternoon is Robert Anderson. He is the Director of Resource Planning at San Diego Gas and Electric Company. He has held a range of positions involving power plant engineering, resource planning, strategic planning, and generation development. His group has been actively involved in implementing AB 32, California's greenhouse gas reduction law. And finally on the panel, we have Jonathan Parfrey, who is the Executive Director of Climate Resolve, LA's premier climate change organization, where he created Climate Smart Schools to help school districts with Prop 39. Jonathan served as commissioner at the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. He is a founder of the Los Angeles Regional Collaborative for Climate Action and Sustainability. And in 2011, he was appointed a senior fellow at USC Marshall School of Business. So please welcome all of our panelists to the stage this afternoon for our afternoon plenary session. Thank you. Uh, so we're gonna, we wanted to uh, model this more as a conversation uh, to th this afternoon, and we're gonna pivot a little bit from a lot of what's been talked about so far around energy and uh, energy efficiency and really look more closely at this topic of uh, resilience and, and adaptation uh, in the energy sector and what that means uh, for, for different constituents uh, within the system. While there's, you know, as, as was discussed earlier today, there's a very strong uh, recognition of the, of the very important role that local governments play in, in reducing emissions. There is mounting evidence, I'm sure many of you are aware, uh, that climate change is going to impact our region in several ways, and is already today, uh, as we can see from you know the current drought. Uh, we've had wildfires much earlier than uh, than uh, of usual here in San Diego County, and we're now at a point where local governments are are really trying to, in addition to look at reducing emissions, also look at how we can prepare for some of those changes coming down the pike. And while we know the energy sector and typically think of, of energy as one of the, the primary areas where we have contributions to climate change, uh, the supply and demand infrastructure of our energy system is also uh, vulnerable to climate change impacts, whether that's looking at warmer temperatures, less snowpack and runoff and rain, uh, more extreme weather events, uh, and sea level rise, and they all pose questions uh, that we do need to start considering today, and many are starting to consider them. So we wanted to uh, have a conversation here, and I'm delighted to have some other Southern California colleagues up here, uh, as you heard um, from some of their uh, positions and accolades. Uh, they come from local governments, from utilities, from community groups. And they are all active in thinking through how to marry this, this concept of mitigation and adaptation and try to uh, take steps today to see long-term resilience benefits uh, and ensure the, the, that we have a robust energy system uh, looking at from a variety of angles. So with that, I wanted to pose some questions to, to each of them. And uh, we do have some time at the end for questions from the audience, so do keep, uh, keep thinking of your questions. And uh, first, I wanted to start off uh, with Rob at SDG&E. Um, so as, as far as how utilities are thinking about climate change impacts uh, and how they might concern the utility, and then also how is the utility uh, here at SDG&E thinking about adaptation uh, in respect to perhaps your operations and, and relations with customers? I, I could say, gee, thanks for asking, but I think everyone <laughs> probably knows this was Slightly orchestrated. No, um, actually, as, as I look at it, um, that adaptation for climate change from the utility standpoint, I kind of put um, things into two different buckets. 
One is what I would call kind of the, the internal SDG&E operation side. What, what things will SDG&E need to do differently within its own operations uh, to adapt to climate change? And this may be everything from you know, changes in our portfolio to um, you know, do we need to design our infrastructure different and maintain and do our operations differently? So it's kind of the, the internal look. But at the same time, I think it's just important for the utility to be looking at what might its customers or what might its customers do differently in the future, and will we be ready to help, help our customers meet their needs? And this is around a lot of uh, issues around as various customers look to, in essence, decarbonize their operations. Will they turn you know, to electrify things more? Um, will the transportation sector move more towards electric vehicles and things like that? So I think the utility's got to be looking at it um, both ways. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us a little bit or give us some specific examples about how you might be thinking about this in the context of some of the upgrades to infrastructure that SDG is doing? Um, well, one of the things that, that we're doing now and um, specifically, and, and it kind of ties back a little bit if any of you are from San Diego, this area, we had some pretty big wildfires in San Diego in, in 03 and 07. And with the discussion of climate change, with the, with the potential for wire files to even get greater over time, um, we took a really hard look at, at how we operated things and how we designed things um, given those wildfires. And since that time, we, we've really begun a, a whole process of, of hardening um, our transmission and distribution system, particularly in those areas that are most susceptible to wildfires. For us, it's, it's mostly out in the East County, up in the mountains, in those areas. And we've taken... Um, We've changed out about 1,600 poles from, metal, um, from wood poles to steel poles. We've changed the spacing on, on some of our wires and gone with heavier conductors. What the spacing on the wire does is, depending on how strong the wind blows, if your spacing's farther apart, the wires are less likely to, to get close enough in order to spark. And so we're really looking at, at, is our system going to be able to take more harsh weather? And if that weather does come, are we prepared in a, in a way to really manage our system um, during those conditions? One of the other aspects of the whole hardening system is we went from having 17 weather stations scattered around our service territory to about 150 weather stations today. Now, we, this is one of the pri largest privately owned weather networks in, in the country, although we made a decision when we first put it in to make all of the data public. Uh, you can go to the National Weather Service or Weather Underground, which is the one I use, pull up the San Diego map, you'll see a whole bunch of little dots of all these weather stations scattered around the county. So if anyone lives in the county, you could probably get a weather station that won't be too far from your house um, telling you what, what's going on in that area. And by, by using this, this weather data, we're now able to, um, to, to actually take that data and every single morning we get a weather report basically for internal operations. That lets us know what the weather is going to be like, what the fuel moisture content looks like. Um, and we will actually um, dispatch crews to different areas if we think the risks are greater. We will change how we operate um, in certain areas if winds are higher and the fire danger is higher. So we're actually really having to modify what we do just looking at this more, um, you know, more, I don't want to say, worse weather or these kind of things coming in order to really prevent the fire. Fires from current. That's great, and I think it's very, really impressive that you've been very collaborative and open with the system that you're creating. Could you speak a little bit more about perhaps some of the partnerships or how you anticipate that this could help cities or you know other constituents in San Diego yeah, work with yeah. you? We, we work with the cities. We work with the fire districts. We make all that all that available to them. Uh, the other thing is when you have 150 weather stations reporting data back pretty regularly, you start building up a really big database really quick. Um, we're generating like 20,000 points a day um, in a pretty massive computer system. Um, lots of research institutions have been coming to us because mainly they want to work on the data. And so we've, we've had a lot of collaborations with, with UCSD and UCLA and, and other climate groups really looking at our data and, and really understanding, um, you know, the forecasting, be able to play with the data, actually improve their models. Um, our, our, I'm not one of our meteorologists, but they said what they've really learned is all the things they thought they knew of how a Santa Ana would come through, come through San Diego and what all the old models said, we're now learning based on our, our really pinpoint data that it actually comes through differently than what we thought. Um, so we're, we're actually learning a lot more of how weather can behave in San Diego than we previously knew. Nice. So it's a constant 
I suppose, adaptation to information and, and adjustment based on the sensing system. It, it really is. And you know, when, once you get it in there, um, it's one of those things you put it in for one reason, and then all of a sudden mm -hmm. you realize now that you have it, there's lots of other value you can get from it. Um, we're now looking at expanding its, its ability um, on the solar side. Mm -hmm. um, a, a day like today, in fact, right now, the, the load in San Diego is probably around 2,700 megawatts, roughly. Um, we'll go up to 28 or 29 um, tonight, probably 8 o'clock or so. But we anticipate that there'll be about five or 600 megawatts of rooftop solar in San Diego probably within the next five to seven years. Well, if you've got five or 600 megawatts of rooftop solar generating on a system that may only be 2,500 megawatts, that means you've got about a fourth of your generation that's going to come up and go down depending on exactly what the weather's doing that day. And I, I live in Ocean Beach. I know there's a lot of mornings where the fog comes over and hangs on for a long time. And so they're actually working um, with a number of groups right now to be able to actually improve our ability to forecast how that solar will behave in every given day. So that way we know how to set up the rest of the system and what other generation will be on in order to, to make up the difference between the solar and, and the loads. That's great. And you mentioned uh, solar. Uh, I'm curious with the uptake, the pretty impressive uptake of electric vehicles uh, in the region, how does that contribute to grid reliability in this context as well? Can yeah. you speak a little bit yeah. to that? Uh, electric vehicles is one of those issues where um, as we kind of turn around, you know, customers are going to begin to look through the utility system for, for new and different products. Um, we've got about 8,500 um, electric vehicles in San Diego now that we take care of that connect to our system. Um, it's growing fairly rapidly. It grew 8% last month. That isn't happening every month, but we are seeing quite a, quite a growth in it. And one of the things that, that we've done, and we've been very aggressive on this, is coming up with a rate structure for electric vehicle owners that really encourages them to charge right now at, at night and during the low load time periods. You, if you get an electric vehicle, you can get a whole house TOU rate, and which actually gives you a really low rate at night. Um, and what we've found with, with the various rate structures is we've really been able to get about 90% of all electrical vehicle charging to be occurring during the lowest load times of the day. In the lowest load times are when power is the cheapest, when we don't need to build any new infrastructure to serve it. So it, in essence, improves the overall loading on the system, makes the system run more efficiently, and that helps, helps keep the costs to everyone. So it's really as we see electric vehicles coming on and other you know, mm -hmm. things that customers may turn to. Can we provide the right signals or the right products out there in order to get that charging to occur at the time that, that it's most economical or best for the system to have it, have mm -hmm. it occur? Um, oh, I had one other thing on that. Um, one of the things that we have found is, is where we've done the time of use rates, we've gone up getting about 90% of it charging off peak. We've studied some other cities that didn't do it, and they got like 80 or 90 percent charging at the time of peak. Um, we have seen one thing that's a little, I don't want to say disturbing right now, but we're trying to sort it out, is some of the worst on-peak charging actually occurs for people who have rooftop solar. It's because they put the solar on. If they size their solar to charge their car, as far as they're concerned, they don't care where we charge it. Hmm. So, so we've got to watch, you know, there, there are interactions that you really yeah. don't expect um, to occur that we're trying to sort out. Right. No, I think that's, that's the impressive thing with all the data that we have, uh, that we can be so in tune with the system. I heard about there was a, a curious person who would come to the San Diego Zoo where there's those free electric uh, chargers and come at 2 a.m. to charge their car. So <laughs> uh, with data, you can find out all these quirks and interesting things that's, that, are, that are going on. What? Um, so I wanted to pivot a little bit to Brendan, sure. who I know uh, uh, the city of Chula Vista works really closely with SDG&E in many different ways, but I have to say the city of Chula Vista has been such a great thought leader on climate issues in general, but also uh, on this issue of kind of resilience and preparedness, and you've done some really impressive, very tangible, um, what I think are you know, low cost, uh, practical things in the city to really figure out what you can take action on now. So uh, Brendan, I was, I was curious. Um, if you could talk a little bit from the local government perspective about how uh, a local government can, can promote kind of resilience in energy infrastructure and, and energy management. You may or may not have heard it's that I was going to ask that you know, question. It's amazing. I have just some notes right here <laughs> to answer that. Um, but I guess first is sort of describing energy resilience because mm -hmm. 
um, or, or the two sides of it because there's the energy supply side and that's kind of the infrastructure that sdg e really manages. Um, and then there's the energy demand side, you know, the existing stress on the infrastructure already. Um, so I wanted to just point that out. And then as far as energy infrastructure, um, you know, of course the utilities, the CEC, the PUC plays really a lead authority on citing those, um, those um, facilities and assets. But local jurisdictions also can influence that process. And so, um, you know, two ways I think is um, land use. Um, we work with SDG, we're working with SDG, I think, to site two substations now in our community. Um, and those are always, you know, interesting topics and conversations with our community members. Um, but and as far as a land use context, um, those CEC, the PUC, they do look at how those substations and infrastructure are um, complying, at least in the spirit, with local land use. Um, so one example of where we've really tried to maximize sort of resilience is on our bayfront. Uh, our Chula Vista Bayfront master plan has been about 25 years in the making. It was just approved by the Coastal Commission. Uh, we work very closely with the Port of San Diego on that project. Um, and as part of the master plan, we actually um, integrated some climate adaptation strategies and climate impacts and, and mainly around sea level rise. So how it stands now that you know, anything built on this 500-acre plot of land on our bayfront will have to be resilient to um, about 16 inches of sea level rise. Um, so that's everything from raising building pads or setbacks and buffers and so forth. So I think it's local jurisdictions ex uh, establishing those kind of, kind of underlying land use principles mm -hmm. I think will help inform uh, you know, where energy infra infrastructure goes in the future and how it's designed. Um, the other side of what I think we have a great nexus with resilience is our hazard mitigation plans. And this is something that in our area really just, um, we're getting back into the cycle. It's every five years, jurisdictions actually work together usually throughout a county, and it's usually your fire department or public safety department, and they're under identifying man-made and natural hazards that, that can occur. So that's tsunamis, earthquakes, to a plane crash. It's really everything. Um, so in that process, you know, we include our energy infrastructure mm -hmm. as sort of critical community facilities. So when we're looking at all those potential hazards or disaster areas, we're also looking at, well, what is the energy infrastructure there and how can we make sure that that, is, that, that um, hazard is impacted mm -hmm. or, or mitigated, excuse me. And then for, for actually this go around, we're going to be hopefully impl uh, integrating some climate change um, perspectives into that hazard mitigation plan. Uh, so I think that's a really op a great opportunity for local jurisdictions to kind of influence mm -hmm. uh, resilient energy infrastructure. Mm -hmm. That's great. I think it goes with that, that real concept that the future is not going to be like the past. I mean, we can't yeah. always just assume we can use the same historical information for our planning. We really yeah. need to start taking what is a wealth of information that we have, especially here in the region and in California around, around climate change. You mentioned a couple of plans, but yeah. I do know the city yeah. of Chula Vista has been a, a leader. You've had a climate action plan for many years. Many years. You're updating it, yeah. as I understand. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about some of the other measures that you have, tangible adaptation measures in the plan. And then also, I understand there's a local, assurance, uh, local energy yeah. assurance plan. So if you could speak to those sure. a little bit. Well, uh, back in 2010, um, we started the process of updating our climate action plan, which had been around for a while, and like many plans, focused on mitigation or reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So this was our first time to look at the potential impacts from climate change locally uh, and how we can um, marry that with reducing that risk through adaptation strategies. And so, you know, the, the risks are, are, and the impacts are pretty common probably throughout the the region and throughout state. the state. I mean, it's wildfires. We're going to see more of them. They're going to be more intense. You know, fire season in San Diego is now all year round. Uh, and that's, it's, it's quite scary. We had our, our first wildfires last month. Mm -hmm. May. 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 And that's way too early. Um, the other things are sea level rise, which I already mentioned. And then really extreme heat mm -hmm. is a big one we're concerned about. They project about, I think, a five degree increase in average annual daily temperatures mm -hmm. 
by 2050. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think it's an increase in about seven, uh, seven times more extreme, extreme heat, heat days events, by, yeah. by so mid-century. So it's another yeah. thing to think so about. I think it's going from two per yeah. year on average to 15. Mm -hmm. So this is obviously really coming up on the radar. Um, so in our adaptation strategies, we're really focusing on um, energy demand, but really through the lens of the ur urban heat island impact okay. um, to address kind of that extreme heat scenario. And we did really three things. We um, updated a city council policy on shade trees. Um, and so the, for the first time, we actually have a, a quantifiable target of, you know, an all new parking lots, there has to be 50% 50, 50 shade tree cover. Um, or there's alternative cloud compliance methods and you can you know, put a solar carport up and that's great too, but there's 50% shade cover in some way. Um, we did a cool pavement study. Uh, you know, in a local government, pavement is probably one of your most expensive assets. Oh, wow. um, and probably one of the most visible. Everyone's calling about potholes all the time. So um, we did a cool pavement study and we are hoping that the results of that, which looked at the different technologies, the different applications and mm -hmm. some cost benefit analysis, um, we're going to be able to inform creating some specs for capital improvement projects going forward. And then finally, we did pass a cool roof ordinance. Okay. Um, so that new homes in our eastern inland, more warmer mm -hmm. area of our city, climate zone 10 to be exact, um, that they are required to um, install cool roofs okay. um, and meet Cal Green Tier 2 standards. So, and and what, what was great, I think, is that um, when we got done with all of this, we looked at those strategies that were energy focused, but in our adaptation um, part of the plan, and they really complemented all those great mitigation measures uh -huh. in energy efficiency that we've been doing for years. So it really rounded out that approach. That's great. I know you mentioned yeah. to the um, the cool roofs and, and working yeah. especially with more inland communities. I know one of the things I was surprised in talking with some of the climate scientists. Uh, at Scripps Institution of Oceanography too, they're really concerned also about the coastal communities and how they're going to experience this extreme, extreme heat because they're really the communities you know that are less set up. They're more no accustomed to opening up that yeah. window and letting no that coastal breeze through, and yeah. uh, that may be a little bit more difficult when we have consistent number of days with humidity, high humidity overnight. So, yeah. I think it's it's it's. Um, yeah, something we, we yeah. need to think about in, in a lot of, lots of different places. And just that, that other plan you mentioned, the Local Energy Assurance Plan, I won't go into much detail, but it was it, it was an effort, and I think the CEC has a, a great grant program to help fund this, but it, it allowed us to look at all of our critical community facilities, from hospitals to our police station to our emergency operations center, looked at how they get energy, um, electricity, natural gas, emergency petroleum, and then looked at how they would fare in, in any kind of um, hazard or disaster situation. And we found some pretty surprising results, such as um, our emergency operations center, which is in the basement of a building, um, it does have a generator backing up that building, a backup generator, but that backup generator doesn't feed an air conditioning or ventilation system. So that they're going to be in this basement in this building with no AC or air ventilation. The emergency people. I so think I'll be very you know, glad you're thinking about that now. It's one of those things like <laughs> let's put that on on the top of our, our yeah. needs list. So. Great. Well, one more question before I yeah. turn the hot seat over to Jonathan. Uh, you, I think you you alluded that you're trying to take a really integrated approach yeah. as much as possible. You know, be smart about integration for for efficiency sake and you know um, just getting things done. I, I think there's a, a new public health initiative yeah. at the city. Um, so I was curious if you could talk a little bit sure. about that. And then also some of the ways that you've engaged stakeholders in this yeah. in this topic. It's it's not just uh, kind of infrastructure things we need to do, but a lot of it's really preparing residents and right. community. Yeah, and um, I I'm really excited about this public health stuff. It's a new task I've been given, and I know nothing <laughs> about it, so it's, I'm starting from scratch, which is is really exciting sometimes. But um, our taste of it was actually in climate adaptation. Um, it was the first time we had public health officials kind of around the table. Um, but even in that case, we were like, oh, how can, we use, how can we use public health to reach energy efficiency goals? Hmm. And so our new, this called Healthy Chula Vista initiative that's looking at wellness in our community, we've kind of flipped that upside down. And now, now I'm looking at how can I use energy efficiency to get to my public health goals? Hmm. And so when I'm looking at a residential um, you know, retrofit project, 
I'm looking at, great, we can do a retrofit and it's going to lower utility costs and there's some societal benefits for the family, obviously, it might create jobs, um, better indoor air quality. Mm -hmm. So that's just been a, a great experience and, and talking of stakeholders, a, a whole new world of stakeholders <laughs> I've never had to deal with before and our, and our our end goals are so over, over, um, overlapping that um, it, it really broadens your ally base. Um, and they also target vulnerable populations, mm -hmm. which you know probably half of us spend a majority of our time looking to get to those hard to impact or hard to reach customers. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's some great synergies in working with public health. Thanks. Thanks, Brandon. Yeah. I know, uh, Jonathan, turning it over to you, we've had great uh, Success, I think, working with you, with our neighbors in LA on some of these shared issues, these things. Often, uh, you know, we have these jurisdictional boundaries, but really we face a lot of the same challenges. And we've really enjoyed working with you uh, and the LA uh, Regional uh, Collaborative on uh, some of the shared issues. And I know you have uh, been working on some of the same things that, that Brendan has. So I was curious to ask you, including some of the cool roof work that you're doing, could you describe some of the other things you're doing to, to mitigate this urban heat island effect in LA? And what some of the technologies are that you think work best in California that some folks in the audience might be able to, to pick up? Uh, thank you, Nicola. And in honor of the uh, hotel that we're staying at, I plan to make four points. <laughs> so, you can always count on Jonathan to make a few jokes during his presentation. Right. So, that's good. so um, first, <laughs> we have to look at the sort of the operating reality of, of what we're facing here in California. And in Los Angeles, uh, researchers at UCLA have been performing some really amazing downscale uh, studies of multiple uh, global climate models. And what they've found is very, very sobering. Uh, they're looking at the mid-century epoch from 2040 to 2060, where depending on whether you're located near the coast or further inland, it'll be somewhere between three and a half to six degree uh, temperature increase in the greater LA area. And uh, then if you look at it through the other sort of uh, screen, you can see it that we're going to have at least tripling of the extreme heat days. And we have some areas that already have, you know, a month or two of extreme heat in the LA area. And so we're looking at uh, many months of extreme heat by mid-century. And the, just the energy loads that are uh, going to be required, the, the uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Labs did a study for CEC looking at uh, what climate change will mean in terms of just energy demand and they were looking towards the end of century and somewhere close to 40 percent additional uh, energy is going to be required by end of century just to deal with climate change. So the questions of, of trying to find the nexus between uh, adaptation and mitigation is really incredibly important and our organization uh, was driven by trying to come up with these common solutions. And we also believe that climate messaging is very important. Uh, the way it's currently messaged by you know, Mr. Gore and Mr. McKibben, it's a scary global sc story. And it's so scary that most people just shut down and they don't want to deal with it. But by making climate change exquisitely local, talking about what happens in your front yard, and then providing answers for people, actions they can take at the local level, it then becomes an empowering experience that they can actually deal with this terrible question and be effective. And so the campaign that we elected was uh, having to do with cool roofs. And so we were able to work with the city's uh, building and, uh, and safety department and we came up with a plan to implement an ordinance mandating that all new rooftops have to be made out of high albedo material and also all retrofitted rooftops also. So as of July 1st, it's the, the law in America's second largest city that every new rooftop has to be a cool roof. Now, there are some, if you please come to our afternoon session, you will learn in exquisite detail uh, how you can actually implement this within your own city. And we'll have representatives from uh, both CEC and uh, Southern California Edison. 
And one of the advantages also of a cool roof is that not only does it drive down energy costs for the customer, not, not only does it help the state meet its uh, AB 2021 mandates of 10% reduced uh, energy uh, use by 2020, uh, not only does it um, uh, actually provide a nicer environment for people who are living there, anecdotally, we're hearing this uh, very, very powerfully, but it provides immediate feedback. It's not something in the future that people will see the benefit of. They'll experience it immediately. And another is during heat waves, you have then a passive technology that could potentially save lives. And also during heat events, one of the great advantages of a cool roof is that uh, it keeps the distribution grid in better shape. There, there's less demand on it. So altogether, we think this is sort of a, a no-brainer for, for California to participate in. And so uh, we also decided to investigate uh, how we could expand that to uh, cool pavement as well. And so the Los Angeles Bureau of Street Services has been working with Lawrence Berkeley National Labs and a company by the name of Western Emulsion to concoct a new uh, uh, slurry, asphalt slurry, that can be used uh, on city streets. And they've been successful. They have a, a new uh, uh, composite material that can be added to the slurry that also reduces the absorption of solar radiation. And so this will enable entire neighborhoods to defeat uh, urban heat island uh, impacts. And to try to have a more integrated vision, in Los Angeles we, we form something called Streets for the Future. And it's a coalition of mostly NGOs to uh, put forward an integrated vision of how to deal with the many environmental services that streets perform. And so we have, as part of this effort, not only uh, an effort to cool down our streets by changing the cocktail and the slurry, but also to have a vision on complete streets and to have a vision also on green streets and capturing uh, stormwater when it rains. And that is the segue to the last area, which is the water um, energy nexus. And this is very important as uh, CEC uh, studies have shown that 19% uh, of uh, energy use uh, in the state of California has a nexus with water. About 10% of that is heating and cooling water, but that leaves about another 10% for the pumping, the distribution, the treatment of water. And so the, the reduction of water through conservation, through recycling of water, uh, and through stormwater capture, all of that together will reduce uh, the demands on importation of water. And this also comes back to resiliency mm -hmm. because as the climate scientists tell us, there is going to be tremendous impacts on the snowpack in both the Sierra Nevada as well as in the Rocky Mountains. And because of that, uh, the imported water because there'll be the shifting seasonality of the snowpack, uh, the imported water will actually be at greater risk uh, to be delivered and more precious than the water that we can generate on our own. And so the more that we can be not fully self-reliant, but have that redundancy of local supply will very much add to our resiliency. So those things together, we think, are, are some strategies that we can do here in California. Uh, again, uh, cool roofs, uh, cool pavement, uh, and uh, uh, water, uh, local water measures, uh, I think, are, are good strategies. What we found interesting, and this was discovered by a, a, a climate scientist out of the University of Miami, in that uh, cool surfaces actually do a better job in protecting public health than even planting trees. That trees add a certain degree of humidity into a certain area and that adds certain public health concerns. So we think that the right way to go is to have high albedo materials as much as possible. That's great. Thank you, Jonathan. It's, I find one of the most interesting things working on this topic is you, it, 
I mean, there's so many different issues that you get into, and I had no idea I was going to get to talk about slurry today. So that's, that's I, I appreciate Cocktails. you bringing that up. <laughs> Cocktails of slurry, exactly, yeah. even better. Um, I, I just want to also pause and, and say congratulations on the work that you've done in, in LA around the cool roofs. I think that's really exciting, uh, and uh, we'll look forward to see how that's um, implemented and, and continue to get some lessons learned from, from you down here. Uh, and thank you for giving us a little bit of a teaser for your panel later on if, if folks want to hear more. Uh, just one last thing before get some maybe closing ideas from the two of you also since you've, you've heard from the others. Uh, did you find any unexpected or unusual things that, that you didn't anticipate in doing some of this research and to try to figure out what were the best strategies? Well, I'll take that on. You know, <laughs> one of the things that I was absolutely shocked to um, to discover is that the absence of, of free accessible water to uh, many people in the urban environment. And when's the last time you went to a park and there was a working drinking fountain? It's pretty damn rare. Some of you are from cities and you're thinking, oh God, you know, how are my, my drinking fountains? They're working in my parks. But I can assure you in the city of Los Angeles, I think only about 30% of the water fountains actually operate. And so when it comes to extreme heat events, and for school children right now, a lot of the water fountains aren't working at their schools, a very simple adaptation measure can just be fixing the damn water fountains. <laughs> Public health benefits. There you go. You heard it first from, from Jonathan Parfrey. Uh, Brendan or Rob, any um, thoughts to reflect now that you've, you've heard from, from the others before we open up for some comments? Well, I'll just give, I know Nicola is much too humble to bring up the great work that um, herself and the San Diego Foundation have done on this topic. So I, they had a report back in 2000, 2010. 2008. 2008. Yep. Sorry, that was um, a regional wake up call on climate change. Literally, this informed 100% of the city of Chula Vista's climate adaptation work. Um, amazing. And they followed up with an even more amazing document. I think this one's called 2050 is Calling. Yes. But they've been able to pull together community leaders from across the board, from the executive director of the Regional Chamber of Commerce and former mayor, to the American Red Cross director, to the Water Authority, um, and it just really highlights, of course, the science and the downscaled projections of climate change, but also it just gives an, an inspiring story of this is not a political issue. Mm -hmm. uh, this is in San Diego, quality of life is our most important thing in the world, and that's what this really report um, strives to do. And I just, you know, I've been, I've, in my position, mm -hmm. and the city of Chula Vista has greatly benefited from these type of sort of third party, mm -hmm. um, this, this type of third party work. So thank you, and, and you should definitely check it out. Well, thank you, Brendan. That was not part of the script here, so thank you for that <laughs> pleasant surprise. Um, but I, I do want to say that we did work really hard and give credit to some of our collaborators. It was done through a partnership called Climate Education Partners, and that's a consortium of groups uh, with, with leadership from the University of San Diego. And uh, we tried to take some of the tips uh, from, from Jonathan, some of the things that they've done in LA with Sea Change LA. Really, again, to make this not just doom and gloom and these impacts that we're gonna, coming to bear, but but also, you know, pair it with um, practical things that leaders are doing and, and really try to stoke this community that is concerned because through all our polling and, and interviews with leaders, we, we do know there's a lot of concern. It's really now just about getting down into the specifics like you're all doing and figuring out, okay, what's actually the question or the tool or the measurement or the, you know, the capital improvement that, that I actually have to change. So with that, I want to see if we've got some, uh, some really challenging questions. From okay, Demetri McBride, County of Santa Clara. On the, the new slurry, the new composition, did you include a study that might have gone through an explanation of or testing of everything, including whether the new slurry has VOCs, you know, emissions, or anything of that nature? My understanding is that uh, they did not test it for VOCs, but what they did test it for was some of the other, you know, standards associated with, uh, with streets. So it's durability, you know, skid resistance, et cetera, et cetera. And it passed all of those with flying colors. In fact, the company is now telling us that their 
probably going to be recommending this same uh, slurry mix in most of their other uh, jobs because uh, they're finding that it's actually lasting longer because there's less degradation from the solar radiation. Do you know if there will be a test on VOCs? I mean, we're just, I'm thinking about it from my own county, but we would be yes. very interested I, I, to know if we whether there's cards, any interaction. I'll, I'll, I'll get an answer for you. Thank you. Jim Dewey, City of Santa Barbara. And this question is for Robert. You talked a little bit about the impact on, uh, on your system generation-wise from solar energy generation and from electric vehicles, but you didn't really talk a lot about the distribution system. And yeah, I know this is kind of in the forefront of all the utilities, but what specifically are you looking at as far as the impact of the positive energy flows coming through the distribution system during the middle of the day through solar? And then possibly at night, you know, as more and more EVs get out there, you know, that's going to have an impact too. And those are nonlinear loads, so there's a lot of old transformers on the poles. And so what is your vision regarding that? Yeah, uh, I'm not the distribution planner, and for that reason I'm, I'm glad I'm not. No, uh, we are seeing yeah, a number of things. One is um, the, the, you know, the PV on the rooftop, Folks are doing it during the day. They're, they're generating excess during the night. They're taking off the grid. And we are seeing some voltage issues out there. Um, we think it will get help some. Right now, there, there are things called smart inverters that, that help with the, the power flow and the voltage on the system. Those are not required. Almost all inverters now actually are built with the electronics in it. And it's a matter of turning it on or off. So it's not a huge cost increase. But we could see requiring smart inverters to be put um, on when people do the solar. Um, the other thing we're actually looking at um, are, are smart transformers. Um, what we've seen in, in neighborhoods, um, people, I don't know if they want to one-up their neighbor or if they see their neighbor do it, they do it. So you tend to see that the solar gets done in the same neighborhood. One neighbor gets the electric car, the other neighbors see it. So, so you tend to see this stuff grow in, in, in dense blocks more than, more than spread out. And adding an electric car is almost like adding another half to three quarters of a house load. And so if you're serving a group and all of a sudden you got four or five electric mm -hmm. cars, it's like someone just stuck another three or four houses onto that same circuit. Um, so we're actually, we've been working with a company um, to allow through, through the smart meter technology, you come in, you plug in your electric vehicle, and, and the main transfer on, uh, on the street will decide literally, okay, we're going to charge this car for a while when it's demand go down, then we'll start charging this car. So I, I think there's going to be a lot coming just from overall technology to really working on, on how to manage this. Um, another one um, that, that I've used in some talks describing to people, and it's kind of under the general theme of the, the future will not at all be the same as the past, is with, with solar getting so cheap, one of the best times to, to use electricity may be in the middle of the day. Okay, and as the utility for the last 60 years, we've been telling everyone on that hot summer afternoon, you know, turn your air conditioner down, do all that stuff to, to reduce demand. If solar really grows the way we think it is, we might be telling everyone in the middle of the day, turn your air conditioner on as high as you can, cool your house off as much as you can, so when you come home at five or six, which is now going to be the time that's going to drive new investment because all the solar is going to be gone, your house is pre-cooled and we won't see that, that evening peak of everyone getting home from work and then turning their air conditioner on. So I, I think people just need to be really open to, to realizing that all the things you used to think were the right way to do it in the past may not be the right way in the future. I had a question. Aaron Clem with the city of Huntington Beach. Uh, Brendan did a, uh, Chula Vista did a uh, energy assurance plan. Have you identified any uh, funding sources for hardening city facilities? Um, I would say that we're in the process of doing that now. Um, like in typical city fashion, someone else actually did this plan and then it like never left their purview. So we're, um, I mentioned the multi-jurisdictional hazard mitigation plan, and that's updated every five years. That's much more of a living document. So this time around, we're actually going to, in that, call out most of the recommendations that were in our LEAP plan, and we hope that that'll help, because, uh, you know, public safety is king in a local government. Hopefully that will drive some action on the LEAP. 
Greg Galvin, City of Santa Cruz. I'm probably more directed to Mr. Anderson. Is um, correct me if I'm wrong, but the average age of the grid in this state is about 50 years. And uh, that being said, if we keep adding more and more and more solar, and you're creating these little distribution plants all throughout the state that are unregulated and non-ISO monitored. And are, are you considering what's kind of, what effect that could have on your grid when you have all those generation plants dumping more electrons on wires that weren't intended for it? Uh, Yes, um, and, and I, think, I think you hit on, a, on another point, if I can weasel in a point I had onto that and then come back to it, is, is in the utility business and in cities, we all tend to deal with long-lived assets, okay? Um, there's an earlier comment about, about re-roofing. You know, if, if someone's going to re-roof now and you don't set up a standard now, you've probably got 20 to 30 years before you're going to be able to impact that roof again in the future. So a lot of these things, if we are going to make progress on them, if we think, oh, well, we don't need to deal with that for another 10 or 15 years, you may have lost a lot of opportunity to deal with things that you won't be able to then deal with another, another 10 or 20 years after that. Um, on the whole, on the, on the solar and the distribution system there, what we're really trying to now start to look at is, is make my job a lot more complicated, because I used to be able to do one resource plan for all of San Diego. And now we may be literally doing a resource plan per circuit. Um, literally having to look at every single circuit, what kind of loads are on that circuit, when do those loads occur, how much solar is on that circuit, can we through our weather network be able to well predict when that solar will be there, how can we distribute batteries out on the various circuits or various places to really do a lot of, I don't want to necessarily call them microgrids because they tend to have a name, but a, a lot of resource planning that used to be around you know, more central station plan is going to get much more on a, on a distributed network basis. And what we really hope to do is be able, by doing that, to actually reduce the need to do additional distribution and, and transmission investment, rather than having it create the need to do more. What is the cost difference between regular and this new concoction? Uh, it's, it's slightly more expensive, but my understanding is that when you take the full life of the of the slurry seal, it, it's, it's actually less expensive once it's amortized out. stg and is kind of leading the way in California with extended summer on-peak hours. And I was interested to know, building on your comment about, you know, people turning on their air conditioners in the afternoon, are you seeing any impacts with uh, system-wide demand and, like, when streetlights come on? A graph, um, if, if you want to, you know, like, like Google something, if you Google the, the ISO duct chart, um, which may sound like a strange name, but, but what it really is, is, is they've taken the load, and this happens to be on a, on a spring day, of what the, the electrical looks like and subtracted off of it basically all the must-take renewable power. And what you see is you see loads start to come up in the morning, and then the net load drops way down in the middle of the day, then it ramps up really late at night, and then it starts to go down again because during the middle of the day you, you get all that, that solar power coming on your system. So that, that's really the thing we need to integrate for. And thus, one of the, the bigger issues is really becoming the, the nighttime load more than the, the afternoon load. Now, thus, the time of use period changed to, to try to get also um, decreases in that night load. Because we don't really want to be building resources just in order, because we've got to ramp up extremely from the middle of the day to a load at night. If we can help shave that load at night, um, we can also you know, reduce our costs and be able to keep rates lower. Great. Well, with that, any Final comments from the, from the panel? Jonathan? Well, I want to ask Mr. Anderson a question. Sure. So uh, when it comes to energy storage, has SDG&E considered taking some of the projected excess uh, renewables, midday renewables, and perhaps hydrolyzing water, creating hydrogen, and, and then saving it to run f through a fuel cell later in the day? And so you have that sort of form of energy storage, but through an existing system that we're already familiar with. Yeah, you know, where storage goes and which storage becomes, you know, the, the best in the future, I think, I think it's going to change over time. Uh, we've got a goal from the, from the Public Utilities Commission to do about, I should know the number off, about 150, 160 megawatts of storage, but that's going to be more of the, the smaller battery storage. If you're really looking at th this big issue of moving lots of, of solar from the middle of the day to the evening, you need something else, like, like the pump hydro kind of thing, where you can take massive amounts of energy and store it. 
Hydrogen, um, we, we've had some, a group looking at hydrogen. It's still very, very energy intensive, you know, to, to generate the hydrogen. Uh, we also heard that there's still kind of a, a battle amongst the car makers, whether they think the electric car is going to be the way to go or the hydrogen car is going to be the, be the way to go. So um, I think we're just going to kind of have to watch and see how these various technologies play out and which becomes most cost effective. But I just want to pause really quickly and thank our amazing panelists for taking time and, and presenting on this issue.